Hello, this is Paola Cervantes here from Chiapas and you are watching Teacher Learning Cast with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Hello and welcome to Teaching Learning Cast and episode number nine. And today is May 5th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart from beautiful Aguas Calientes. Morning, everybody. Teacher Learning Cast one more time back on the air after a couple of weeks of vacations here in Aguas Calientes, having a joyful time at the Feria de San Marcos, which is just about ending. This is Piri Herrera, uh, hoping. You are still with us here in this uh, educational cast for everybody. Yes. Uh, um, yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, I just for the ones that are connecting for the first time in Facebook Live and also here through YouTube, this is a weekly show that we, Ven Dr. Benjamin Stewart and myself, held every week, eight fifteen in the morning, about education, a uh, little bit tending towards um, uh, language learning. But the idea is just to bring up topics, questions, and discuss whatever you want to discuss with us, and hoping sooner or later you join us through your questions and comments. Yes, we're always looking for uh, teachers to participate, not only uh, watching the, the, the broadcast, whether it's watching the live broadcast or the recording, because all of our sessions are recorded, but we're always looking for teachers who also want to participate and be part of the live broadcast, the Hangouts. So uh, please let us know. Reach out to us. Let us know if you'd like to participate, and uh, we're totally open in the different topics that we try to uh, to address every week. It can be a, a topic that we looked at in prior weeks. If you found something that uh, strikes your interest and you want to uh, address that same issue again, that's great. Or if there's uh, some issues that we haven't discussed yet, uh, those are certainly welcomed as well. So yeah, reach out to us. Uh, the easiest way would be just to leave a message in our Facebook uh, page teacher learning cast uh, you can reach out and uh, be part of the conversation uh, there's many ways to participate so we do thank you for listening and watching and uh, again always are open to feedback what you like dislike about the show things that we're, we've missed things that you disagree with us um, we're always uh, uh, open to receive that type of feedback Yes, you can reach us through our web pages too. We have the Facebook fan page for Teacher Learning Cast, which you can look like that, Teacher Learning Cast, or Benjamin Stewart website, which is benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com, or my own website, which is homers2000.weeksite.com uh, slash pdha. You can also Google Teacher Learning Cast with the name Benjamin Stewart or the name Piri Herrera included, and you can reach us very, very fast. Uh, we've been discussing different topics at uh, mainly, I think, a surface level, then, because uh, we don't have that much time to, to really get that deep into the topics, just trying to raise interest into certain questions. And uh, last time we discussed about the SIAP model and teacher talking time in the classroom, certain aspects for a couple of weeks, we discussed about that. And, uh, and we always share our experiences. What do we have for this week, Ben? Today, Petey, we, uh, we're going to talk about a performance task. And we've talked a little bit about um, critical thinking and really some of the topics we've just uh, talked about in the past. We're going to re uh, revisit those. But really in terms of what's called a performance task, I'd like to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this idea of performance test because I know that you also work a lot with um, teacher trainers, and I'll be interested to get your feedback on some of the challenges maybe that uh, one might face when implementing a performance task, and, and maybe you have some things to share about maybe some successes that some of your students have had. But we're also going to try to tie in performance tasks with how to connect to the, with the students. Uh, your, your segment, uh, you're going to be addressing that, and I think we're going to see some some commonalities, some things to consider really in how we can try or the importance to reach out to students and connect with those students, especially when developing performance tests. So I think we'll just dive right into um, 
a performance task. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this time. And I came across this study that really looked at different uh, traditional teaching methods versus the communicative language teaching approach, and which came out roughly in the 80s, in the 1980s. And there's been a lot of discussion back and forth about different methodologies or different teaching methods in language learning. And even to the degree that some would uh, say that we're really beyond uh, a method. But I think it's still important to look at some of these quote unquote traditional teaching methods versus this uh, communicative uh, language teaching. And I hope after today, looking at performance tests, I will have succeeded hopefully in looking and giving you one option of how to maybe approach the communicative language learning and in terms of more concrete uh, activities that you might be able to use to take advantage of it. But I wanted to share this article with you just to, because it's a fairly good article in looking at uh, the comparison between these quote unquote traditional ways of, of teaching versus uh, more current ways of looking and focusing more on communication. And in this study, they look at uh, basically five or six different constraints that I wanted to share with you first before I go into performance tests and ask you that to consider some of these constraints and how how much these uh, constraints really affect or could affect your own particular context when looking at performance tests. Now one of the findings or one of the uh, constraints that they mentioned or one of the challenges in uh, implementing a communicative language teaching approach it is this idea of time constraints. So it's just there's not quite enough time in order to uh, implement a communicative language uh, teaching approach. A second challenge was just the difficulty in selecting suitable activities. And I, I'll talk about that a little bit today uh, with regard to performance tasks and what that means. Another thing that they mentioned in the study was, a, was the cost factor and that I guess it was expensive to implement uh, this type of uh, approach. Another challenge was the size of the classroom. So maybe a communicative language teaching is more difficult for uh, larger classes. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, another challenge, a hesitation on the part of the students. So maybe some students weren't willing to participate. And finally, challenge of promoting self-learning or uh, really trying to find the role of self-learning within a communicative approach. So I wanted to share briefly those challenges and we'll be re revisiting some of these when we start looking here at uh, what a performance task is. Mm -hmm. So a performance task, basically I'm referring to Wiggins and McTighe's book, Understanding by Design. It was published in 2005 where they are promoting this idea of understandings or the six facets of understandings. Um, and looking at how we can promote critical thinking in, through these performance tasks. And they propose this backward design where the idea of performance tasks really is something that's thought out and designed by the teacher before instruction, before teaching occurs. So the idea is that the way in which we are going to ultimately assess students is determined before instruction begins. And performance task is going to be one of those ways that that we have available to us as teachers to evaluate our students. Of course, we still are going to have other options or other ways of evaluating students like quizzes and handouts and different performance criteria that we typically are already using. But performance test really is going to be the, the ultimate, the ideal type of performance that we're leading our students up to. And uh, if you want to think of it in terms of like an authentic performance, uh, that would be uh, more in, in line with what, what, I, what I mean here. So when we look at the different characteristics of a performance task, the first characteristic would be that a performance task calls for the application of knowledge and skills. So it's really this integration of knowledge and skills that, Petey, we've talked about uh, a lot when we look at content knowledge and skills and, and how can we perform, how can we have our students really merge and integrate these two together. So it's not just separate, that we're not just focusing on linguistic skills. We're also trying to help them learn something 
about uh, you know about issues and context that they face in real life. And so it's not just about recall and recogni uh, recognition, it's really about how to integrate knowledge and skills, this declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. A second characteristic of a performance test is that they are open-ended and typically they do not yield a single correct answer. Okay, so this is kind of an extension of a maybe a Socratic method approach where the, the ultimate performance that the students are in are going to are going to be a part of. Uh, there is not a yes or no, right or wrong answer. That there's going to be some flexibility, and that should be part of the way that we ultimately assess the performance. Is that it's not just one correct answer. Another characteristic of a performance task is that it should establish some novel and authentic context. And this idea of novel, I think we can easily look at when we're trying to promote language, because most language, if not all, is novel. The sentences that I'm using right now are being created on the spot to communicate an idea. And I probably have never used any of these sentences exactly the way that I've used them in the past. And so when we are promoting language with our students, we're trying to have them create language for a particular purpose. And I think this characteristic is very much represented here in what we're looking for in performance tasks with our students, that they are able to create language. It's not necessarily a script, although I'm not uh, suggesting that scripts don't have a place in a performance task, but you know, there, there's going to be some aspects of the performance test that are, is going to require language that's being created on the spot in the moment. Mm -hmm. Another characteristic, performance tests provide evidence of understanding via transfer. Now, this is interesting because this, you can look at this in many different ways. Transfer of knowledge or understandings or transfer of skills. We want to look at um, a distinguishing between those three, knowledge, skills, and understandings. Um, how can we transfer that? Now, this could be a transference from uh, from another class, another language class. If we're looking at an English language class, and maybe they learned uh, certain aspects of dietary and nutrition in prior weeks, they're going to have to recall and, and rely on that information, that declarative knowledge, and bring that into the ultimate performance test. And then linguistically, of course, skill-based um, uh situations where they're going to have to be using, let's say, the present tense, the past tense, maybe using prepositional phrases, whatever uh, language or grammar or vocabulary that they learned prior uh, in prior classes, how can they transfer that in, into the class? We can also look at a transference into things outside of uh, or ideas or understandings from outside their formal education. So maybe it's something that they learned in, uh, in real life. It could even be academically learning from other classes and bringing maybe they, you know, if it's a math class or a science class or a history class, they bring that information, that knowledge that they learned in those other classes and they bring it into this performance task in a, a language learning context. Another characteristic of a performance test is it, that it's multifaceted. Okay, so unlike traditional test items, that typically assess a single skill or fact, performance tasks are more complex. So when you're thinking about the criteria, the standards by which you're going to be assigning a grade for the performance, the, this multifaceted approach needs to be incorporated in, that, in the, uh, in the uh, let's say, rubric, for example. Maybe a rubric is used, uh, uh, an analytic rubric, where different criterion are being identified that represent these multifaceted ways, the different ways in which students can, uh, that are going to, different ways that they're going to be evaluated. Okay. Number six, performance tests can integrate two or more subjects. Okay, so I mentioned this a little bit earlier. So they, they can, uh, what they're learning in other classes can be part of the performance task. And finally, they're uh, open-ended tasks and evaluated with established criteria and rubric. I kind of addressed this as well. So it's, it's being very clear in how they're going to be assessed, but also giving them some opportunities for uh, really designing and really even maybe even negotiating with the teacher what kind of performances they ultimately do. And I think this addresses, Petey, in your case, you're, you're going to talk about 
finding ways to connect with students. Right. I, I, I'm wondering in your case, what you think about this idea of how to reach out to students and how much of some of these performance tasks could be negotiated with students beforehand so that the idea ultimately that the, the performance task is going to be meaningful and relevant uh, to, to them. You know, I think it's going to require at some point some level of understanding of who the students are and, um, and, and how we reach out to them to see how we can negotiate these performances that are going to be predetermined, that they're going to be actually decided upon for the most part before teaching begins. I don't know what your take is on, on that, and maybe uh, you can address some of the challenges that some type of performance test, the way that I'm presenting here, might, uh, might, uh, might be problematic or, or a challenge for some of, some of your teacher trainers. Right. What I'm understanding by this is that um, it all goes around the context itself. And uh, maybe that's precisely the situation which may be difficult for a student, the definition of the context itself. We've talked about this before, I guess, and, and, and we have uh, come to, I think in one of the first shows, we uh, explore a little bit uh, different characteristics of the context in the class. Now, uh, the idea of the context and the performance task, it's the, precisely what you mentioned as the integration. All of these different aspects like the transfer, like the linguistic uh, demand from, um, plus the other demands that it requires, um, the integration of the authentic context, uh, I mean, it's one of the of the characteristics you mentioned in there. Uh, it, it all goes around a, a wider a, a idea, a, a broader idea of the context itself. We're not just talking about having a topic uh, or, or something that relates to uh, where to use uh, the, the new linguistic feature. We are also talking about the environment that is surrounding students their prior experiences, as you mentioned before, uh, whatever they come, uh, they bring from uh, the outside of the classroom at the moment of the class. I mean, it's, it's kind of another dimension of context. It's not just thinking about which context in real life and situation, which is the way I've been managing so far in, in the different discussions we have had. Uh, how will, will you use uh, this in real life, in your own uh, uh, environment? But this also includes the actual uh, momentum uh, environment for students, what they're studying, other subjects, are you, as you mentioned, and things that uh, they can bring into the classroom at the moment of the performance task, so it becomes more, more meaningful. Now, my point in here would be, uh, why would you like to have uh, this kind of contextualization or this kind of performance tasks, which are applicable and, and related to whatever they, they, they can bring into the classroom or they will use in the future or both things at the same time? Well, it, it's, it, it's, I think it's all about the transfer itself. It's, it's gonna be easier if they, if they familiarize with it uh, in a closer way than just presenting a feature and an imaginary situation uh, or, or simulation in the class, which sometimes is gonna be difficult for them. And, and sometimes that's gonna be the challenge for students, for, for, for language learners, uh, it, that's gonna be the challenge to follow up the contextualization or the simulation. Uh, but the idea with this performance task is, uh, and going back to your prior questions, is exactly that, to reach out to students and understand what you can uh, consider for this performance task that makes it meaningful, that mm -hmm that makes it powerful to stick in the student's mind. And that's something I, 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 I was gonna talk about uh, and later on about reaching out to students, but I think it's worth it to mention. You need to understand uh, your students, you need to know your students in order to make this uh, emotional connection. And I, I don't know if I've mentioned before this about the emotions in, in, in teaching, and, and, but this is something that Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate mentions because, because he's a specialist in, 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 in mind and, and all these neural, uh, neural things uh, in general. He's a doctor, but he talks about education in that sense. 
you need to make a connection with this emotion if you really want to uh, get into students as to help them learn. So I think all of this is like uh, talking about performance tasks gave us a point to make all of these connections about the context itself, about the environment from the students, about the future, about the linguistic aspect itself, and about this uh, approach for, for making this emotional teaching. Yeah, that, I, I, yeah. yeah, I think it's important to also distinguish between what I mean by here, a performance test versus test-based learning. Okay. And really look at it, and I was going to talk and wait and just to discuss this a little bit later, but I think it's going to be a little bit more appropriate to do this now. Um, the I still wanted to address, kind of give you a very hands-on way of looking at how to design a performance test. But before I do that, the idea with a performance test is let's say that you choose some period. Maybe it's a, a period of a unit. Okay. Um, it could be, let's say, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. In this example, I'm going to use four weeks as an example. So let's assume that over a period of four weeks of instruction, at the end of that four weeks, and let's say that, that this four weeks or these four weeks uh, is, a, is a unit, that the students are going to be asked to perform uh, or, or do a performance task. So the performance test would be something that would be led up to over the course of four weeks. And so in, in this, I'm, I'm proposing that we think of it in terms of some sort of uh, curricular map where let's say in, in language learning, we would have certain grammatical structures, right? So here under column C and B, and this would be extended over, of course, a column per uh, grammatical structure, right? So. For week one, weeks one through four, the students would be covering certain grammatical structures over the course of, of this uh, period, right? So actually this would be down here, right? So we would have actually, no, this would be up here. And then you would just put a check mark, maybe an X here. Okay, so right. this week we're going to talk about simple present. And you know, next week we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, personal pronouns, et cetera. So, okay. So here you would have the linguistic part of the map. And then here you would begin indicating certain types of activities. Now, this is where there's a difference between task-based learning and performance tests. In a performance test, these enabling activities, that is, different activities that students are going to be doing on a weekly basis mm -hmm. will enable them to do something more further advanced in week two. Similarly, these enabling activities would allow them to be uh, to be able to do activities that are a little bit more uh, involved and complex, right? So the idea is to move from the simple to the complex until they reach, in this case, when week four, the, per the ultimate performance task. And right in, in this case, maybe the, the task is to teach second graders nutrition. So here, let's look at a GRASP framework. A GRASP framework really is just kind of an easy uh, way of looking at how to go about creating or designing a performance test for your class. So the first act, the first element, G, uh, relates to a goal. So this performance task is not so much the language goal, because as teachers, we're always thinking about the linguistics part of it. It's really the authentic part. And this speaks exactly to your point. How do we provide context? How do we provide something that's going to be meaningful and relevant to the students? And so in this case, this is just an example, but here we have a goal of creating a brochure to teach second graders the importance of good nutrition. Mm -hmm. So the topic here is nutrition, and we're only mentioning second graders here just as an example, but this is, you know, this would be the, the audience, right? So the audience is going to need some sort of very simple explanation of what nutrition looks like, right? So maybe the students are going to teach, they're going to be teachers. Their role is, uh, is a teacher. And they're gonna have to teach very simply to second graders this idea of nutrition. Uh, the situation here, this is the uh, S, first S of the GRASP framework. You need to show the difference between a balanced diet and an and, and unhealthy diet. So there's gonna be some sort of compare and contrast. So notice here, We've got two things going on. In the situation, we have identified uh, a critical thinking element, compare and contrast, right? So they're going to have to be able to compare and contrast. This is a, 
critical thinking skill that we would ask most of our students, right? And uh, regardless of their level uh, of English, right? Most people can compare and contrast certain things. Now, maybe they struggle with the language, but the idea of linguistically here would be using some sort of uh, transfer, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, transitional phrases where they're using, they're going to have to use maybe the comparative adjectives and superlative adjectives and so on. And then the audience and the role, if you look between the difference between the role and the audience, the teachers are going to have to use technical or an, and some sort of knowledge base uh, around nutrition and convert that to being very simple, to be able to promote that, not sound like experts, but to sound relatable to second graders. So that's a skill in and of itself, looking at something very, you know, uh, maybe uh, technical and difficult in, cer in certain ways and making it very simple. So just by being choosing the right roles and audience in the situation, I think we can see an example here of critical thinking skills and, and different um, types of ways of thinking and presenting ideas and knowledge that students are going to have to face in a real life, you know, in a real life context. Uh, the last two points here, the, the P stands for product performance and purpose, right? So there needs to be a need for doing what they're doing. You need to create a brochure. So that's going to be the product. Mm -hmm. And uh, that describes healthy and unhealthy uh, eating and shows that at least two health problems that can occur. All right, so there's a uh, also process. I also kind of look at it as process based, like what kind of process or performance are, are they going to uh, to do? And here the purpose seems very obvious, right? But the whole po point of creating or designing good performance tests is the purpose is so obvious, right? That that it has some value for the the students, right? So the purpose here is very important that they should be they should know why they're doing what they're doing. Finally, the criteria, right? So how are we going to assess? And I talked a little bit about this before. Uh, the criteria for the success or the standards that are going to be used for the performance. So the idea here is to kind of look at your planning and you know look at the resources that you have. And this doesn't necessarily need to cost a lot. It doesn't necessarily need to take up a lot of time as far as the performance goes, because you're not really spending that much time on the performance itself. That's what I want to focus on here. My point mm -hmm. is that these enabling activities right. and the way that we maybe use some of the activities we already do, right? I'm not proposing that we don't use quizzes, that we don't use other traditional ways of uh, methodologies based on the, uh, what I mentioned earlier today when looking at that study here. So maybe we're using translation method you know, direct method or whatever, we're using these other approaches here. But we're integrating those into some ultimate performance where we are going to, ha as teachers, take a different role, more of a facilitative role. But it, we lead up to that. This is not like day one, they're going to be doing a performance test. Of course not. But day one, they are going to know what kind of performance test that they will ultimately be doing in let's say in four week time frame. So I do think it is, is important that students kind of have an idea about the performance that they're going to do. They're going to know that in four weeks, to use an analogy here, they're going to be playing the baseball game, right? They know that they're leading up to that. They're not ready yet to play the baseball game, right? But they're leading up to that. They know that at the four weeks, they're excited because they're going to get out on the field and play baseball. So that's the point that I want to make here is that we try to find those key performance tasks and there's many examples of performance tasks online that you can find and and get to know your students and real and you mentioned a good point about emotional learning I think that's very important right and if students really like second graders they like to you know present these with with kids great now maybe they don't have an opportunity to actually teach this to second graders but the idea is to try to find authentic, as authentic opportunities as possible and try to use technology as much as possible so that those authentic audiences, if there is a way to connect to real audiences, they can do that. But mm -hmm. if not, you know, they still have an audience that they, that they can relate to. If we're talking about language learners who have no interest in second graders or whatever, or even nutrition, maybe then this is not 
not the ultimate performance task, but it really is about trying to know your students and if possible, depending on the maturity level and the context, negotiate these performance tasks beforehand with the students so that there's a level of buy-in, there's a level of acceptance and, and maybe even excitement at, from the very beginning thinking, oh, wow, this will be cool. We can you know, create a, a video or a brochure or an audio or do, you know, create something with our hands and with regard to this performance test and that it's not just about the language. I mean, maybe we're focusing more on the language, but that there are other elements involved. There's other knowledge and skills that we're concerned about that it becomes part of the performance test. Right. And, and this, is, uh, uh, this is precisely what I mean by a, a broader definition of context and a broader view of the context. This idea become having the performance test and all this development that you that you are showing us like with the idea of um, uh, week by week uh, supportive activities and presentations or quizzes or whatever the teacher is doing in order to support and lead the students towards uh, reaching out all of this idea of the performance test becomes the con the context itself for the day by day class in the day by day class the teacher then uh, has to keep in mind uh, what's the objective of doing all of this week by week activities and that also modifies the way you teach and the material you use even the examples and and I think that's uh, the examples you use in the class and I think it's something really important because I've seen a lot of teachers in training and and and, and teachers already um, practitioners that are already uh, in service and and some of them still work uh, and struggle with this idea of having the linguistic part and then living at the end of it just bringing up examples which they even create at the moment of the class by drop by i know which are the elements of the linguistic feature let's say it's a grammar structure so I know which are the elements of the grammar structure, so I'm able at the moment to create whatever example because I know the word that fits there. So if I if I have a, a structure that says subject, verb, object, I just drop whatever subject I can think of at the moment, whatever verb I can think of at the moment, and then I may ask my students to give me an object, and that's it. Uh, this and, is, but yes. Yeah, this is the point. Exactly. This is really, I want to stress the importance here of what you just said in terms of performance tasks. A performance task, and that's why I bring up the map, the curricular map, is it's not, it's knowing beforehand more or less the series, the way in which you're going to present all, pretty much all of the activities. Now, I don't mean every single activity within one class, but you know that the this class is going to help them do something tomorrow, the, the next day, and then the next week but that you're leading and maybe you're gradually moving from more simple activities to complex activities so that linguistically speaking, they are going to be more prepared at that fourth week to do the performance test. So yeah, it looked, it requires us as teachers to take it maybe a different approach to our planning, looking at it more holistically so that we are looking at um, a series of, of, of activities or a series of events that are going to lead up to that and, and, you know, we've all been in situations where, and it, it's, 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 and I don't see anything wrong with coming up with maybe activities, you, you know, some students are not going to be progressing like you, like, as you want, so you're going to have to improvise, you're going to have to adjust, you're going to have to adapt, and, you know, maybe the activity that you are going to implement tomorrow, you just came up with on the fly, and that's fine, but as long as the, the at the end of the day, at the end of the week, so to speak, here you can your the students are moving from more simple um, activities to more complex, more simple ideas to more complex ideas and skills and understanding. So again, that they're they're going to be able to look at uh, their performance test. So um, yeah, it's if you are in the habit of as a teacher just looking at activities in isolation, then this is not exactly the approach that. I want to share with you today with performance tasks. It's really looking at the performance task as going back to the term enabling activities because those activities should enable students to do something more uh, linguistically 
and knowledge and, and based on their knowledge base. I like to go on and on on this because it just yeah. came to my mind the idea of this is something that you cannot do by yourself. I mean, you need if you have an a, an academic team working for a group of students, it may be something that uh, it's more likely to be done as a team, right? And uh, and it implies a lot of other things. So, but before going on in this, I'd like to invite our audience uh, to to connect with us to make comments, to leave your questions, and, and to go back to the prior programs that we have, different discussions. We've been talking about different topics, and you can reach us through our different uh, media in Benjamin Stewart website, which is uh, benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com, my own website, uh, hummers 2000 weeksitecom slash pdha, or you can go to the fan page in Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast, and you can reach out there, and you can Google Teacher Learning Cast with the name Benjamin Stewart or P.D. Herrera at the end, and you can find all the ways to connect with us. We are hoping to have you with us every week or to join us to a transmission and discuss with us whatever you want about education. Also, I'd like to share a couple of events that are coming up. If you have any events that are related to English language learning or teaching in general, feel free to share those also, and we'll try to promote those. But uh, I'd like to share three. Um, the first being MEXTISOL 45 International Conference, a groundbreaking dawn in ELT. That's going to be October 25th through October 28th in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco. Also, ANUPI 16th International Conference for English Teachers Conference. This is a uh, they've titled it Internationalization and Digital Learning Perspectives and Challenges in ELT. That's going to be on October 18th 20, through the 21st in Waltuco, beautiful Waltuco, Mexico. Very beautiful down there. And uh, also, I want to share a local event here in Aguascalientes in our own BA uh, and right. ELT. Uh, there's going to be an exhibition. Um, for teaching aids, and that's going to be this month, May 22nd. I'm very excited about that. Uh, it's going to begin at 9 a.m., and it's going to be at our own local campus here in Aguascalientes. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing all the different uh, teaching aid students uh, work so hard on uh, throughout the semester. They show, show a demonstration how it's worked, how, how they use it in class, and uh, that's always very good. I hope that we can be on that event, PD, and get some uh, direct, some interviews from students. And uh, and later we'll be looking at talking with uh, Ariana, the teacher yes. for the class, and uh, getting additional insights from her. So definitely looking forward to that. And if if you are around and available for any of those events, uh, feel free to take part in those. Right. This is uh, the teaching aids. Uh, exhibition it's something organized by adriana macias and hopefully we're going to have it here at the program uh in one of these future close weeks uh, to us well just uh going back to to the talk and the idea and, and linking a little bit uh, uh my topic for today which is about reaching out for students uh I, I was uh, focusing a little bit on the idea of the performance task being uh, something relevant for a student, something important. So, so I managed to, to put a question just to reflect about, what if the performance task is not suitable, proper for students themselves? What if the performance task is something that uh, it's, we cannot say bad, but it's something that it's, uh, something that students wouldn't really find attractive or interesting or they wouldn't really uh, care about doing something like that and uh, and that's when 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 where my my, my idea for today comes uh, because that's a point for reaching out to students I mean that would be the first question why would you want to reach out uh, students and make the connection with with the students right and, and that's the point making the connection with the students it's it's uh, it gives you the advantage of um, actually having human interaction, not just uh, not just plain uh, bureaucratic teacher-students relationship, which uh, at the end becomes like I've said before. What's the difference between the teacher and the book if you are just there just to provide information and let them grasp whatever they want, right? Or or um, well, the idea in here is just to make the connection. And when I was 
when I was looking for different information about teacher talking time and, and the management of time in the prior shows, I found this uh, quick, oh, I don't know how to call this. It's a, it's a note, a, a short article. I'm, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, from Nicolas Provenzano, a high school teacher. Can you see my screen, Ben, there? Can you actually see it? Yes. Uh-huh. All right. And uh, and he mentions three ways, three easy ways to make meaningful connections with your students. And that would be the point. You want to make the connection with the students to uh, know how to adapt or how to contextualize your teaching. You want to make the connection with, with the students to know uh, which are their strengths, which are their opportunities for learning, which are the uh, their actual situation. And again, what I mentioned as a broader definition of context, what the environment at the moment of this learning is in the outside, in the inside, in the intra, in the inter. I mean, a lot of things that you can get from there that help your class to be developed in a more meaningful way. So he mentions three very, very easy things. And the first one he mentions, it's take the first five minutes. He has also an article. There's a, a page which is called, uh, the, the I think it's his web page, which is the Nerdy Teacher, this one. And, um, and he's got a lot of information there, but he's got this, another short article like this one in which he talks about the first five minutes of the class in order to set the tone for the class itself. But uh, this is something I discussed with my, my teacher's information many times. You have to uh, take the proper time at the beginning of the class, not just to set the tone, but to um, uh, get yourself also in this moment of connection with the, the student. To, to put yourself uh, along with the students in the mood of we are here to do something together. And, and that's when uh, different approaches come for different kind of warm-ups. And, and he mentions uh, in his article about having a talk for the first five minutes and informal talk with the students. Uh, I would also talk about all this drilling at the beginning and, and the chanting and the singing and the, and the greeting students and, and according to the age of, 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 uh, and the level they are in. Uh, but these five minutes, yes, can help you a lot to establish whatever is going to happen later on in the class. If you, in my experience, if the first five minutes you are unable to reach into students to get their attention and to get them in the mood for the class, it's going to be a hard class. It's going to be something you're going to be struggling with during the whole time. Now, uh, in this case, I would say, uh, my opinion is that no matter the age of the students, the situation is the same. The effect is different, but situation is the same. The students are not connected with the class. The students are in their own stuff. Now, younger learners may be uh, hyperactive and may be noisy, and maybe uh, creating a mess in the classroom, which is what normally we understand as the misbehaving as a, and a problem in the classroom. But it's the same thing that happens with adults, but in a different effect. They do not shout, they do not jump around the classroom, they are not, but they fall asleep or they do not pay attention. They just get disconnected from the class. And all of these effects, whether you are young or, 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 or um, elder, or, or you are in college, in high school, in primary school, uh, all of these effects come from the same situation. Something happened in the classroom, uh, since the very, maybe since the very beginning, that it's not making the connection with the students. So these first five minutes are gonna help you to get yourself together with your preparation of material and being ready for the rest of the class. Sometimes I recommend my students Get everything set so you don't miss time looking for your stuff in the back or, or organizing your flashcards or sticking something on the board. You better take the five minutes to prepare all of that and then have a, a, a little bit more fluent class in that aspect in which the time you take for 
regrouping yourself or reorganizing is minimum or it can be done fastly while students work in their students working time. Uh, the second aspect he mentions is attending extracurricular activities. And I take this, the second and the third aspect, which is be available. And I think take this as something we have discussed before. Uh, where does the teacher work ends? Do I take off, off the suit or do I put it on all the time? And I think, uh, well, these two activities, first of all, attending extracurricular activities, engages uh, students with the teacher in the sense that uh, now we are not looking at ourselves as, as different figures, but as peers, as uh, let's talking about our context of language learning as language users uh, with perhaps the teacher being the more the the user with more experience which can help us a little bit more because he is supposed to be the one with a little bit more experience with the language but uh, as same as equals which is uh, something that is now involved being equals and, and reaching out to making no difference between people I think this can apply also with uh, teachers and students in that sense, right? Yes, I may be a little bit more experienced in certain aspects as a teacher, but that's it. That doesn't mean I'm a different person. And this attending extracurricular activities, uh, it's, it's gonna help you to start making the connection in different issues not related to the class, which may help you later on to bring into the class and uh, to create this contextualization that we've been talking about during the, the, the whole show. Right, and and it's pretty similar to the third one. Being available for students, students have needs, have different kinds of needs, not only in learning, but as humans being in general. And sometimes the teachers are figures that we are there, maybe not to solve the problems or issues or situations that they may have, but yeah, we can be there as again as peers, as a person with a little bit more of experience. Uh, maybe not to give advice because that may not be the role, but at least to have this disposition to be somebody uh, with whom uh, the, the student can make this connection, right? And we go back again. Why do you want this? Because this is the way I'm going to learn from my students. I can understand different aspects from their lives, from their interest, and not only the traditional, what they like, what they don't like, but in general, what they, what they, their situation is right now as, uh, let's say, the stage of development in their mind, in the way they perceive things. So I can take advantage of that and make it more meaningful in different ways, not only in the way of, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this to uh, help myself to do my job and get them to learn this linguistic aspect. No, but also to be able to say, uh, yes, I'm gonna take the opportunity of this class or, or, or whatever we are going to learn and reach out beyond the linguistic topic to maybe learn something different, what we've been discussing with all these different approaches of not only focusing on the, um, on, of, on the linguistic demand, but also the different kinds of demands that, that any activity or task in life has. So you can integrate different topics, you can if integrate different tasks, uh, and all departing from knowing your students and knowing how to adapt them. Now making the comparison and making the match of this uh, uh, with the idea of the performance task, if you get to understand what students would really uh, accept or take as something uh, intriguing, as something um, that uh, that causes them emotion, that that they are willing to really reach and accomplish as a performance task after several weeks. And if they see that during the class by class situation, they are actually working on something that is going to lead them to. Uh, I'm thinking about, uh, well, a good example would be the teaching aids ex exhibition. It's something the students are really, really interested in doing because they are the ones that prepare everything. But the teacher in the day-by-day -day basis is uh, working along with the students on the material, 
on the necessary theory uh, to be explored and to analyze in order to get to create all of these uh, crafts and uh, aids and all the kind of uh, things they bring into this exhibition. And the class becomes something totally different from a traditional class, right? And that would be the why you want to reach out to students. And I think this, uh, this teacher from high school has a, a very clear and short point because we can discuss a lot about this and, like, and, and very professionally. We could even talk to, to psychologists and see how to reach to somebody. But he's making some very effective points for class. Just take some minutes of the class. And I wouldn't say just the first five minutes. Maybe you need to take five minutes in the middle of the class for it. Maybe you need to take those five minutes at the end to prepare something for the next class, but take those five minutes. And the point is making a human connection with the students. Attend extracurricular activities. And I would take that as leave the class aside in a proper moment, not in class time, but leave, leave the class aside and take the time to engage with the students in something that helps you bond with them and, and create a, a better relationship. And at the end, well, yes, be available as as you are available for friends, as you are as you are available for family. Students are needy also of uh, being having somebody with the characteristic of a teacher uh, to be available. Because sometimes my learning needs. Let's focus a little bit on the learning. My linguistic learning need. It's focused on the requirement of having an expert of the language closely at hand. Well, what about that? <laughs> a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, no, and, and you make some really good points in this, this article. This uh, teacher, really, there's a lot of good issues here, good points here. And I think uh, going back to the, to the performance test, that it really, I think it gives us a good excuse, right, to, to reach out and find ways to connect with our students. And going back to this first five minutes, right, yeah, maybe at that first day, if you're going to talk about a performance test, you might even spend almost the, the whole class just thinking about what kind of performance that you might want to do. But the point, if, if you can agree and get buy-in with the, the students from day one, the point is that they're going to be more engaged the next day and the following week as they're building towards that their performance. But I, I, I really like that idea of really trying to connect, even if it's outside of academics, uh, just trying to connect, finding things. And through that process, those first five minutes, you're also learning. You're, it's almost like you're investigating. You're learning from the students what they like, what they don't like. So it's a matter of taking that information that you get from those five minutes and then rechanneling that information back into the academic context, right? And whether it's, you know, you're looking at some sort of linguistic structure, but you're you're drawing on topics that they maybe mentioned and talked to you during those first five minutes, right? So you're recycling that information, learning as you go along, as we all learn from our students every day, as we learn and know them better over time. So uh, I think that's that's a very good point. I think uh, being accessible uh, today's technology allows us many options. So it's really just a matter of each of us as teachers finding ways that are comfortable for us that that match the way that we like to teach and the way that we like to interact with our students to make decisions about okay do we use email or not do i use my personal email or my work email do i have some sort of online platform do i use facebook what are those what decisions do i need to make to make myself more accessible so that they see that we care, right? That we're available, that we're able to give them timely feedback and uh, in, in a way that they can relate to. And a lot of times this is just a matter of finding spaces that they're already in and maybe we get used to the spaces that they are, that they like to interact in. But it's really about this self-discovery as a teacher and student, how we are going to uh, be communicating over the course of, uh, of, a, of 16 weeks, for example. And then the extracurricular activities, yeah, I think that's that's an interesting uh, thing as well. I know, uh, especially for younger students, and really having a relationship with parents is essential. I think it's really important to have. I know a lot of teachers have platforms precisely for parents as well as students, so that parents are always informed as to the progress and how students are are doing are coming along. 
Um, so I think being available for extracurricular activities outside of class is very important, especially for the little ones. And, um, you know, making sure that, 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 that the teacher really is kind of the, um, maybe the bridge between the communication between the students and the, the administrators of the school and the parents and making sure that all of that information is being uh, communicated openly, right, as, as much as possible. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to mention about performance tests, and I think it kind of links to what you're talking about with this kind of emotional part and can, this personal connection that we want to try to make with our students, is just the ease in which we can easily take this a step further and bring in um, people from the outside, you know, audiences from the outside, whether it's not just parents or um, not just parents, um, but, you know, people from the outside, both of us, PD, we get invited to uh, events and to judge, for example. And I think anytime that you can bring in people from the outside, uh, maybe outside the school or just outside the classroom and bring it into part of the, uh, the learning process, that um, that it's um, that it's important. I know you got cut. You got cut off there. Yeah, I got cut. I got cut. But basically, what I was saying is that the importance of kind of taking it a step further and bringing in outside uh, experts and people from the outside of the, the own classroom and using maybe performance tasks, but trying to make or have students draw a, con a personal connection to their audiences, not just the teacher. So. Although the teacher is very important and we want to make that personal connection, it's also trying to help learners make connections with individuals outside the classroom. And I, and I know we both of us have had uh, the pleasure of uh, judging events and exhibitions from other schools where we see these performance tasks essentially where students are maybe they're, it's a cultural day and they're, they're talking about a, a country and, and the different aspects of a country and so on. But that if we can, as teachers, try to help students also make connections with their audiences or with people from the outside, I think that's also another uh, step in the right direction, right? I think that's part of our uh, responsibility as educators is try to use technology and use the resources that we have. It doesn't necessarily mean that we need the, the, the the greatest, the latest and greatest of technology, but that we use the sources that are available to us, the resources in a way that students can make connections, not just amongst themselves, but uh, to the outside world as much as possible, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and something, something I, I, would I would like, like to, to close with, with is uh, uh, the article is uh, uh, as you are doing it right now. You are not, and the article is not losing track of the objective and the educational focus. I think it's important to say this because when talking about connection, there's a thin line between uh, the educational objective and personal needs. Now, I know I mentioned about uh, going a little bit beyond the linguistic topic, and yes, the, uh, the human connection and responsibility that we have as a society. But we have to be very careful. And, and, and my humble opinion is that we have to understand that students are not there to supply our individual, personal, non-educational, and professional needs, and vice versa. Now, yes, there may be a point in which this connection may help you uh, in certain individual, non-educational uh, situations, but that's something that it's very personal and it's not something that um, we are talking about right now in this discussion. We are talking about, yes, making a deep connection. Uh, when talking about emotions for students, we are discussing about different things, but from my point of view, uh, it's important not to lose track of the educational objective. And I, I think that will be. <laughs> no, and, and, I, and I'll just add to that, uh, um, that we have to not lose sight of the reason why we're trying to make that connection. And that is to build trust with the students. Yes, exactly. And if you don't build trust with students, 
if you are favoring some students over the others or that you're not giving that you're not being fair to right. all students and so i i'll just add that 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 right. we need to make sure that we that students feel trusted that they can trust their teacher right and that they're being treated fairly and i think if you don't if you if you keep that in mind and you're being honest with yourself as a teacher that you are being trustworthy and you're being right. honest and fair with your students that making those personal connections will be uh, to your advantage that'll be a good thing right but um but yeah there are lines that can be crossed as i don't think we need to go into the specifics right. where we know what we're talking about here it's just being uh aware of that and uh and really just making sure that we're uh being trustworthy and fair to to each and every uh, student so right, right. And I think the, the time is reaching us, and this is something uh, I mean very interesting about the performance test, talking about the reaching out to students, making the connection. We can uh, we have more material for emotional uh, learning and all these aspects, but the time is um, as always reaches us very fast. And uh, well, the experience of the week, well, it, it pretty much was going to be the invitation to the teaching aids ex exhibition because this week will be doing some promotion this coming week. We'll be going to radio in Radio UAA to promote this event. And uh, we'll invite everybody, which you already did, Benjamin. And I think that can be enough for the day, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I want to thank everyone for watching and those who are watching the recording. Again, we encourage you to reach out. Let us know if you're using performance tasks. Let us know how, uh, how those are going. If you want to be part of the conversation, let us know. Uh, video is a great discussion. Thank you. And I, I want to say uh, to everyone, have a good week. And we'll see you next Saturday, same time, same station. And uh, take care, everyone. Again, thanks for watching. Right. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, everybody. Keep on learning.